yeah, we can see objects beyond them on the other side. Out. Yeah. Yeah, they're blinked out, and it'll come back on in a second. Blinks there was right. a Japanese documentary which showed this thing blinking out, and it, it showed, when it showed frame by frame, it showed, it showed a green light emanation just before it blinked out. Well, this is from that documentary. Oh, I see. That's where it came from, yeah. Billy shot nine sections of movie film and gave them to Junichi Yaoi at, uh, in Japan, and they put together a stuff called Beam Ship, the movie footage. Wow. Originally, it was called, uh, a film came out in Japan called Contact, and then the contact bombed at the box office. Nobody showed up to watch it. And they previewed it in Kansas City about 1982 or something like that. And people booed the movie. They didn't believe it at all, so they took it off. And so then it came out on videotape like seven, eight years later, and all this footage was on it. You know. Nobody was too interested in looking at it. See how the craft just kind of floats? Let me move on down, because there's several on here. And Billy's not really zooming in. He doesn't have a zoom. That's the Japanese cameraman excited. What you're looking at is Billy was in his living room showing this footage uh, on his own movie projector. And the Japanese came over with their video camera in the living room sitting next to him. And they're taping off of his screen. So that's where, <laughs> where we get this. Here's another section of a flying in. I'll kind of fast forward through some of these because I think it's kind of long. So. I mean, how many ships can you look at, huh? This one's kind of cute because Billy's, he's trying to, he's walking out in front of his camera and he's trying to get them to perform some maneuvers, do something sensational for the camera, and they don't understand what he's talking about, and he will eventually get bored and just quit. You know? And there's the craft sitting out there floating out in the background. If the best ones are still to come, let me move on down the road here a little bit. The ones that are made by the Germans are made by anyone else on this planet. How far can they go? We're not sure. We think the Germans have pretty much solved the whole problem. From one we understand, they are able even now to, um, uh, they're going to other worlds. We don't know the distance with which they can go. Uh, we don't know for sure whether or not they figured out how to be interdimensional or not. Uh, the ones that we're building are very beginning stages things where the craft are still taking off with rockets. They get up in the air, they turn the drive on, and then the craft is then operates from there. They're not taking off and landing with the drive units. We're, we're, we're a little behind in the technology here. Here's three of them out there floating around. And You know, that's the curious thing. I think at certain levels of security, obviously, on this planet, everybody knows what everybody's doing. So it's at some point up there in higher levels, everybody knows what the Germans are doing, what the Americans are doing. We don't know. We're the last ones to learn about it. But I tend to think that the Germans are probably, I like this one, that races across and then wobbles. Uh, there is some cohesion, if that's the word, between America, England, and Germany, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. I think we've tried to get along with them at some point to get information from them, but the people in Congress know that the United States is not interested in having open contacts with a renegade band of Germans. Everybody's going to yell Nazis and scream, and they're not gonna, it's not going to work. Um, are we dealing with the Nazis? Apparently not. Uh, after the war, they were very fragmented, separated, and went their different ways. The group that's building these discs, apparently, are the ones in Brazil and the other factories over in Tibet, apparently have gone off planet, met ETs, and become very spiritual oriented on their own quest and don't hang out with the others any longer. So it's, it's not really very clear, but I think in the future that's what's going to unfold, what we're going to find out, what's been going on the last 40 years here on our own planet. Notice when they go to the right or left, they have to tip it up, and then it kind of staggers to the right, staggers to the left like an old Star Trek episode or something. That's because the, out the bottom, we're pretty sure the field comes out the bottom and has to push the craft, so it kind of slides to the left in an awkward manner. They're not really designed for slow speeds or idling, you know. So they can go really fast, I guess, but 
They're not, yeah, they're not very good at slow speeds. But this thing about traveling beyond light speed to go to the conversion of like special plot energy. Lights, please. Um, yeah, one more thought on that, and then we'll kind of get off the engineering here. Um, you obviously can't go that fast. Uh, we already know there's something called the mass speed uh, correlation theory, where we cannot accelerate any matter beyond a certain point and it implodes upon itself. Uh, that we already know. So even if I had a ship here today, we all got aboard for the price of admission tonight, we're going for a ride. We went out and got in the ship and got inside of it and punched the button to say, go to, where do you want to go? Let's go to the Pleiades and say hi to the folks. Well, we couldn't fly there in the ship. It would take, even if we had the speed of light, and we'd be going 400 years to get there, so we don't have that much time. So they have obviously come up with some methods to move the craft much faster. I've had a couple of talks with independent engineers that are designing things, you know, for uh, JPL and NASA on what their theories about it, just to see if they were thinking along the same lines at all. I says, how are you ever going to accelerate anything that fast? He says, well, you're not. What you're going to have to do is make it interdimensional. You're going to have to change it from a physical form to a non-physical form so it can move at the speed of subatomic particles. Beyond, and when we do that, we're not sure what's going to happen. That's kind of what they're doing. They dematerialize the craft. It's converted into a non-material state that contains its own map of programming. And then when it's in a non-material state, it's no longer in reality, in the three-dimensional world. And once it's not there, it steps out into what scientists generally call hyperspace, which is another reality where material matter doesn't exist. And in there, time is different. A single second in the timeless is equal to millions of years in reality. So you can benefit from that, like stepping into the fast lane, and then, if you have correctly included your mapping and parameters within your non-material state on where to go, you can zip up and down the universe then in hyperspace in a non-material form, going wherever you want and the clock is standing still. They said the idea of folding space isn't real. It's a clever thought, but that's not really how you do it. Space is not being bent or folded. You're just changing your own uh, essence to do this. So then you go to where you want to go, and the real trick is to be able to put yourself back together and stay within the same time frame. Because here's the clue. Once the craft is in a non-material state in this <coughs> hyperspace, if the particles that you are now existing in slow down, you come back back in time. You'll re-enter in the past. If you accelerate the particles relative to the speed at which they started with, you move forward in time. And think about this, if a single second is equal to millions of years in reality, it would take very little of a change for you to slip off millions of years. Get lost. Get lost real good. Uh, they said that the universe is literally full of beginning time travelers learning these concepts. And that, that these secrets are very closely guarded because to understand them also begins to unlock the matrix of the universe and gives you access to knowledges which is very, very dangerous. So they don't teach anybody this stuff. They say they guard it very closely. It's too dangerous. They being the Yeah. It's not, not healthy to learn, and they say, until people earn their own responsibility with it. Okay, I got a little drawing board here. It's great.